page number 20 and sing about it. Amen. Praise him a bit. Amen. Mm. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing all earth. His wonderful love proclaim. Hail him. Hail him. Highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praise as Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbound, dead, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reign it forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. All right, great to see everybody here tonight. Let's go ahead and be seated. Father, bless the service tonight. We need you. Thank you for this good crowd you brought out on this Wednesday evening. Thank you for a beautiful day. Bless the youth conference coming up this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see everybody here this evening. And we don't want to miss any visitors, but I don't think I saw any. But if you are a visitor for the first time, we want to make sure you raise your hand. But I think everybody here are repeat customers. And uh, so it's good to have you. Good report from Sunday night's prison services. Two saved, right, Brother Steve? Two men got saved on Sunday evening, so we praise the Lord for that. This is the weekend of youth conference, so again, I want to make sure everybody knows they're invited. Big thank you to Jessica and Rebecca, the decorations. <clears throat> it's 5G is the theme, and that's what we have on our cell phones, right? And a 5G connection, and so it's kind of a, there's 5Gs like God, grace, go, gospel, uh, give, I don't know, I, 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 there's 5Gs that are, that's what it's all about, and it's going to be great. And uh, we have some new churches coming, so we'll be praying for that. A lot of people will be hands on deck. Looking forward to a great, great youth conference. And appreciate all the work that's already gone into it. So. All right, let's see. I guess we'll I guess we're going to do our offering at this time. Let's go and do our offering. We'll get our offering plates ready, and uh, we'll take up our offering. And then, of course, Sunday's activities uh, are back to normal, except Sunday evening we will be having our Bahamas testimony service. Our brother John Stone will be the featured premier speaker of the night but we'll show you over 40 pictures and maybe talk you through it and and uh you know just tell you kind of some of the things that went on and then hopefully most of the crowd will give testimonies and uh, you'll get to hear from the folk that went they'll test testify a little bit about their experiences and then of course we'll have brother stone preach and we'll be done so looking forward to this weekend's activities busy weekend but it's gonna be a great weekend and i know god's gonna bless all right let's take our offering at this time let's pray father thank you for this day bless this offering for your honor and glory. Thank you for being so good to us in Jesus' name. Amen. For those that don't know, we did take on some new missionaries for support this past Sunday night, and we are grateful for that. So should we do a scripture song tonight? I didn't plan one. I thought about, actually, it's kind of different tonight, but maybe we should do at least one. Let's take a favorite. Randall, why not you come on up here? We'll see if the sound room, they're, they're, those guys are professionals now. I don't know if you can see the screen as good. But they can see the side screens, right? We're good there. Uh, but you should have these, some of these songs memorized by now. Let's take a favorite. Who's got a favorite scripture song? Who? Who, 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 who? Somebody? Brother Carlisle. Romans 5, that's a great one, Brother Carla. Hard to beat that one. Let's go to Romans 5, and uh, <laughs> you automatically put he's everything to me. That's a, this is just a great one. I love Romans 5. Romans 5, we'll let you stay there, seated, meditate on the words of this song, and uh, what a blessing it is to know that God committed his love toward us. So let's sing this tonight. Sing it from your heart. Be a blessing to the Lord. Here we go. 
Amen. Y'all sound good. Think about this access we have. Amen. We have access to God because of Jesus. Amen. By whom also? Here's the one we love. God commendeth his love toward us. What a blessing. Great singing church. Good, good, good choice, Brother Carlisle. We'll have our hand singing song this time. Brother Hurst, thank you so much. Amen. Amen. God is good. Boy, I tell you, last night I got to, I got to working on some stuff last night and got to going with it. And um, I was listening to my Pandora and uh, I had some black gospel on. And uh, what's his name? Charles Jenkins. Uh, some choir deal, deal. And it was awesome, God. Or awesome. God is awesome. And I played it like. Ten times in a row, and I ran out of playbacks, and I kept playing it again and over. And man, I was about to have a shouting time about 12:30 this morning. Amen. So uh, that would be, uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, guess what? They're probably gonna play it in heaven too. <laughs> but uh, amen. It's it's so good, and I was just enjoying basking. And I was like, God, come back right now. I mean, it was just it, when you get in the presence and you get just worshiping Him and glorifying Him. I mean, that's what we are here to do. You know, Jesus, others, and yourself. That's how you're going to have joy. And so, man, I just, I love Jesus. And, yeah, you know, when you tell everybody about it. Page number 18. Let's go ahead and stand. Page number 18. Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing about it. Amen. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. Fellowship a bit. Tell somebody about how you love Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Let's pick up on the third verse here, Earl. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. All right, you may be seated this evening, and of course, if you are going to class, I think everybody pretty much knows where they're at. Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 3 this evening, First Thessalonians chapter 3. Some of you are asking me, I've been asked quite a bit about my, my nephew, little Conan, he's still having a, a tough battle, I just continue to pray for him. He, uh, for those that don't know, he uh, got sick, he got dehydrated, he's been fighting a virus bug for probably two weeks. And then Saturday morning, they were so concerned about his lack of hydration that he got taken to St. Mary's, and uh, they decided they couldn't treat him there, so they sent him to Columbia, and he's been in Columbia ever since, the new University Hospital Children's Wing. <clears throat> and he's been there since Saturday night. He's still there, and he just can't keep food down. And they put him on IV for a while so he can get hydrated, and then they try to take it off so he can get hydrated on his own naturally. And then he just throws up and gets sick again, so they keep putting Now they're considering surgery to correct his intestinal issues and stuff, so... They're going to make a decision, I think, tonight. So my sister said to ask you all prayer for him. He's a little six-year-old, one of the twins, and uh, he's all the way down to 30 pounds. So poor little guy is really struggling. So if you all could pray for him, maybe uh, that would be a blessing. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now notice there's not a period here. It's going to continue thought that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So notice that today, notice this verse here. It says to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Tonight we want to talk about the subject of the comfort of faith. The comfort of faith. Thank you so much. We'll enjoy special this time. Sarah laughed in her heart at God's promise. Isaac proved nothing is impossible. Martha wept by the tomb of Lazarus. Oh, but death lost when life spoke a miracle. perfect time he's never been late his plan for your life is worth the wait in God's perfect time you can always trust when the moment is right the answer will come in God's perfect time Sometimes between your prayers and God's answers, faith can be so hard to hold on to. And with every passing day, doubt whispers, oh, but don't give up, cause God is gonna move. In God's perfect time, he's never been late. His plan for your life is worth the wait. In God's perfect time, you can always trust when the moment is right. The answer will come in God's perfect time. 
haven't heard his voice and you don't understand you're still in God's loving hand in God's perfect time he's never been late his plan for your life is worth the wait in God's perfect time you can always trust when the moment is right the answer will come in God's perfect time in God's perfect time in God's perfect time I've known this young lady since she was a baby, and I can remember many times she'd always want to ride in the car with Uncle Randy. She'd sing at the top of her lungs. Boy, she's come a long way. She's got a beautiful voice. Thank you so much, Taylor, for singing for the Lord. I'm proud of my little niece there. And uh, I'm still your favorite uncle, right, Taylor? She said, I always, I always have been. When, I, when they were littler, I was the favorite uncle because I'm a jungle gym. But even when they get older, they, Taylor's one of my, she's, she's a blessing. I'm proud of her. Thank you for singing. That was a blessing. Uh, you know, Sunday morning we talked about uh, being kind and trying to make a difference there. And, and uh, I may even mention this Sunday morning, I've been on that theme a little bit lately, just the way our world is going and, and the, the struggles people have. <clears throat> the word comfort is, I think, something, is something that people are seeking out now probably more than ever. In the stressful world, um, a lot of mental attacks today, our minds are bombarded. Some call it information overload, psychological overload, emotional overload. We are definitely struggling with many of these things in the generation in which we live today. And this week I saw uh, a video of somebody that I, that, I, that I follow and kind of respect. He's a, a conservative a talker, speaker, and he said that, how many of you have ever been to the Golden Gate Bridge before? Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It's quite an amazing, I think it's one of our famous national landmarks in America, and it's it's an amazing sight. Uh, my wife, me, and Brielle and Rana had been there. I don't think Grant and Claire had been there, but you walk across. We walked across the bridge and then walked across, walked back. And uh, sadly, it is actually a very popular suicide spot for many people. And they said that there's about 2,000 people that have jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, and only 39 of them survived. Only 39. So 40 would make it exactly 2%, but 39, which is right at one point, you have a 1.97% chance of, of surviving if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. It's quite a depth. There's, there's a height, long, a lot of height between there. And, of course, when you stand on the Golden Gate Bridge, you look out and you can see Alcatraz uh, in the distance there. And he went on to talk about how a man that made that jump, tragically, he was successful in his attempt to commit suicide and when the authorities found his body, they, of course, they do, they always do investigations to make sure there's no foul play involved and things. They went back to his room at his apartment that he lived approximately three miles away from where Golden Gate Bridge was. And there was a note that was left behind that simply said this, I'm going to walk to the bridge today. And if one person smiles at me, I will not commit suicide. In a three mile walk, not one person smiled to this man. And he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge tragically to his own death. And we live in a very busy generation now. And, and Satan knows that. And Satan wants to bombard our minds. And so many times, Satan gives us presumptuous things. He wants you to assume things that don't exist. He wants to create problems where there are no problems. And if Satan can get a Christian out. Now, that's obviously, I don't know anything about this man's salvation. And this podcaster doesn't talk a whole lot about faith. He's just a conservative reporter. And he was just trying to give the illustration that we should be smile and go out of our way to make somebody feel better today, right? Be the reason, I love this quote, that somebody smiles today, right? Be the reason somebody smiles. Um, I mentioned some pastors this past Sunday, and some of them were on the phone with me today just going through tough times, and just a lot of people going through tough times. So here's what the devil likes to do, and this is why this message is a little important. It's a bit different than some of the Wednesday nights we've done. What he loves to do is to get you or me to somehow figure out a weird warped way that it's all God's fault. 
That it's God's fault that I'm in this situation. That it's God's fault that I'm in this predicament. That it's God's fault that I'm going through this tough time. Because if God was such a good God, he would deliver us from that. And that's the same logic that lost people use when they say statements like, how can a loving God send people to hell? It's, it's, and we, we disagree with that statement, but we have the same logic when we say those things. And listen, <clears throat> I have had those conversations with God in my life. I'm not saying I've never had those. I've questioned God and, and gotten frustrated. And so Paul here is, again, talking to this very early church that is so fired up for God and, and so excited about being saved. And this Gentile church is just on cloud nine, but they're suffering persecution. We, we addressed that last Wednesday night, the opposition. And in verse 2, Paul says, sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you. It's important as Christians to be established today. To establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. To comfort you. Now, this is an interesting thing. So tonight, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit down here and talk to you from my heart and encourage you about this subject because it's such... To me, it's such an important subject here because I see probably now more than ever Christians questioning God, struggling with God, frustrated at God, and getting bitter at God. And God is never guilty of the things that we accuse him of. Satan would love for us to be at odds with God. And Satan really doesn't care how you feel about him. He doesn't care. As long as you have some weird feelings toward God. And so it's easy to say this early church in Thessalonica is like, man, we're saved. We're fired up. We're growing in the Lord. We, we got the grace of God and everybody's excited and we're just, we're just, everything's just exploding and things are going great. And now we're having opposition. Wait a minute. This isn't supposed to happen. God's supposed to be a good God. And why, why aren't we having, why, are we, why isn't life getting easier? Why is it getting more difficult? Well, because of the opposition. We know that. And so here's what Paul says. Paul says, I'm going to send Timotheus there. And Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That's an interesting statement. He says to comfort you concerning your faith. He actually wants to comfort you, comfort me concerning our faith. What does that statement really mean? Have you ever thought about that? Have you breaking it down? So what is he saying here? Is he saying that uh, he's going, the faith should be comforting us? Um, should the faith... Uh, be the reason we find comfort well yeah that's obviously something you could see there but since there's not a period there and you read verse three that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. no man should be moved by these afflictions and here's what paul is teaching us here tonight he's teaching us what faith brings to our life here's what faith brings all right you ever thought about this when you had this faith we know that faith is an important part we have faith in salvation. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We cannot please God without faith. What did Jesus constantly say to his disciples? Oh, ye of little what? Faith. Hey, wherefore didst thou doubt, right? Now listen, church, this is a very important statement to make. Don't miss this now. Wherever there's the presence of faith, doubt will always hang out nearby. Wherever there is the strength of faith, deception is just around the corner. Because doubt and deception are the antithesis the enemy, the opposition of faith. The stronger your faith is, the less trouble you'll have with doubt and deception. Eve believed what Adam told her, and Adam got it straight from God. So Satan, all he did was get her to what? To doubt. Her faith was strong that morning, but when doubt showed up, immediately her faith was threatened, and in that particular battle, doubt and deception won. Many of us can testify to that. I'll be the first to testify that there's been days that I woke up and I thought my faith was on, you know, like your cell phone, right? It's like 100% charged, you're ready to go. But by noon, doubt was all over my, it was all up in my grill. I mean, I was struggling with doubt and deception. And I was assuming things and presuming things that aren't even real and not even there. All right, so stay with me now, church. So as you read this passage here, the Bible here says that he's going to, he's going to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now listen, when, what faith brings to the table is this. It brings forth salvation. It brings forth confidence in God. It brings forth joy. Faith. Imagine your life without faith. You know, you think to yourself, as soon as I heard that story about the man who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, my first thought is, man, I wish somebody of faith would have told him about the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, many of you can testify tonight that the faith that you have in Jesus Christ 
is the reason why you're here tonight. The faith you have in Jesus Christ is the reason why you're saved. The faith in Jesus Christ tonight is why you're not living a lifestyle, another different lifestyle that who knows where would, I sometimes wonder where would I be tonight without the faith that Jesus Christ gave to me. When I got saved, when I got born again, my life was transformed. Everything got better. I mean, I was playing football and I was dreaming about different things. And, but where would I be tonight without the faith that God has given to me? Thank God for that. But also what faith brings to the table is doubt and deception because where faith is, there's always going to be doubt and deception. There's always going to be. It's always lingering. And that's why Jesus was constantly telling his disciples not to have doubt, to have faith. And when Jesus was saying, oh, ye of little faith, he's saying the reason you have little faith is because you have bigger doubt. You have bigger deception. So unfortunately, a lot of times in our life, what faith brings to the table is the very thing that combats our faith. It can discourage and diminish our faith. And so in that process of diminishing faith and discouraging faith, we then automatically will fall back to our nature and begin to blame the giver of the faith to us. But remember, Jesus is the author and finisher of our what? Faith. He's also not the author of confusion. Confusion is something else that comes. And so God is teaching this early young church at Thessalonica be careful. You actually need to find the comfort of your faith, meaning the faith is what's brought you some of these persecutions. Your faith is what's brought you some of these oppositions. Your faith is what's brought you some of these assumptions. Your faith is what's brought you some of this discouragement. But let me comfort you concerning your faith, meaning this. Keep that faith because in the midst of that faith, in the strength of that faith, in the growth of that faith, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Faith is like a muscle. you got to keep exercising it. Uh, I, I get around my Uncle Ray, and I'm always mesmerized by his faith, man. The man is just, you talk about a man that lives by faith. My Uncle Ray, he, he never set aside any retirement because he gave everything he had back into his ministry. He doesn't have hardly any retirement, but I can tell you stories. How much time you got? I could sit up here all night and tell you stories of things my my God has done for my Uncle Ray. My mom could too. Miraculous things that you just look back and say, wow, his faith has been exercised. His faith has grown. And he's a giant when it comes to faith. You know, the great hall of faith, the Bible teaches us in Hebrews chapter 11, is full of people who just exercise faith. Faith is not a respecter of persons. You and I have the opportunity to have that same faith, to exercise that faith, to believe like we're supposed to believe in the subject of faith. And yet so many Christians today use faith without realizing it as a reason why you're going to be upset and mad at God. And look here, I have been there. We've all been there, I think. So Paul says, Timotheus has got it down. I've been teaching him. He's going to come and establish you first. And then he's going to comfort you concerning your faith. In other words, hey, hang in there. Because the very thing you think that has brought you this ill is actually what's going to carry you through all those tough times. That's the beauty of the comfort of faith. So tonight, church, this Wednesday night crowd, the more spiritual bunch, y'all are just, y'all, I look out on this crowd and I see holiness just oozing out of those pews. Wisdom, uh, spirituality. Um, actually, they didn't come tonight. But anyway, you guys are, you guys are doing great. I'm, I'm proud of y'all. But no, seriously, the very thing that we, we realize needs to help us and give us victory is the very thing sometimes we turn on when we need it the most. So remember what faith brings to the table. You know, I, you know, I love the ocean. I love sharks. And, and uh, every once in a while, my kids will catch me just downstairs watching ocean videos. Like, literally, I'll, I'll find some documentary with that weird guy's voice, you know. And the humpback whale, you know, they always have some weird accent explaining the whales and how they eat the krill and the fish. And I'm just mesmerized by it. But sharks always, the presence of sharks always brings these, these, I forget the name of these fish, they're annoying fish. These little fish that tag along and they follow these sharks all the time. You know what I'm talking about? And the sharks let them hitch a ride because these little fish are groomers for the sharks. All right? Now, if you've never met those fish, when they get away from the sharks, they're annoying. They will come up and just bump you. You know what I'm talking about, Brother George, if you've been there. They'll, they'll, just, they'll keep bumping you in your leg. They don't bite you, but they'll bump you and harass you. And it's like, man, get away from me. And, 
and, and those same fish could be destroyed by the sharks if the sharks wanted to, but they're not on the shark's diet. But they follow the sharks around everywhere the shark goes, right behind them, right behind that one fin in the middle of the, of the shark's body, kind of below their dorsal fin. And they follow them around. And whenever a shark tears into its prey and those little crumbs fall off, those little pieces of meat, those little fish will go eat those little pieces of meat. And then they groom the sharks. They clean the shark up. They, they, they're, their, they're their masseuses. They're the spas. The shark has a personal massage, masseuse, spa person that follows it all through the ocean all the time. In other words, what I'm saying is the presence of a shark almost always brings the presence of that annoying fish. And I don't like that fish. I like the shark, but I don't like the fish. Right? And the point of this is when faith, the, the stronger you grow in faith, Johnny Pope says like this, new levels brings new devils. And as you grow in faith... And as you get closer to God, you better believe as that faith gets stronger, there will be more opposition. There will be more, more opportunities to doubt, more opportunities to be, feel like you're being deceived, more opportunities to lash out and blame God. And that's why even Jesus makes the statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that statement, when Jesus made it, he was actually stating the truth. He was. But the Son of God, who had unlimited faith, immeasurable faith, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who had that perfect faith, also in the same breath said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when Jesus said, my God, my God, have I not forsaken me, he was telling the 100% truth at that moment because God had forsaken him. He doesn't call him. Notice this. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't say, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? God didn't forsake him as father. He forsook him as God because God, the God side of him came out and saw my S-I-N on his S-O-N and God's wrath had to be executed. According to Isaiah 53, he smote his son. And Jesus, though, knew still that the very faith he still believed in, and humanly speaking, was going to be his very comfort in the very end. And that's why he was still able to look at the thief on the cross and say, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He was being truthful when he said that. And Satan wants nothing more for you and me to copy that statement. But the fact of the matter is, is when you and I feel like God has forsaken us, he has not. So tonight, church, I, 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 it's a warning for all of us. In these last days, there's a great falling away. I'm talking to you from my heart as a pastor, as a friend. There's, there's a great falling away happening right now as, as we speak. People are abandoning the faith. They're, they're turning on God. They have defined Jesus, a new Jesus. That's not the real biblical Jesus. They've become experts on grace all of a sudden. And I notice, if you'll notice this, grace has become the new buzzword. And mercy and faith have become distant words. Grace has become the new obsession because grace now gives me a license to think whatever way I want to think, a license to sin, a license to do whatever I want because God is such a gracious God. He is a gracious God, but just as gracious a God as he is, he is a holy God and a righteous God, and the comfort of our faith will make sure that we keep that perspective in proper balance. So tonight, church, I want you to look at this passage and think about what he's teaching here. He's saying, wherefore, wherefore, because of what was before, the opposition, the battles, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer. He's building up Timothy's resume. He's saying he's a minister. He's a fellow laborer. What Timothy's going to teach you, he's been through. And by the way, again, Timothy and Paul and Silas and all this crap. Remember, Silas was, was a part of this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 way back in January. We talked about him. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they know what it was like. They know what it was like to wonder. They know what it was like to struggle. They know what it was like to battle. But Paul had to say things like this. And whatsoever stand I am, there were to be content. Paul knew what it was like to be up and down. Paul, <clears throat> was your Christian life worth it? Was it up and down? Was it good or was it bad? Was it tough or was it easy? He'd say yes to all of it. Because there were days when Paul said it was sunshine and everybody wanted his autograph. And there were other days where they beat him half to death and threw him in a jail cell. And it's easy at that time to say, God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the devil says, that's music to my ears. Don't do that. Find comfort in your faith. Because as your faith grows, the battles increase. As your faith grows, the attacks come. As your faith grows, more inconveniences start to show up. But you find out, you realize, wow, that's growth. That's growth. Mark Twain said that when... 
He was 14. He thought his father an odd, absurd, and strange man. But at 21 years old, he was shocked at how much his father had really grown in life. And somewhere along that 14 to 21 years in many Christians' lives, we begin to get disenamored with God. We lose our awe of him, and we begin to make God almost a scapegoat for our problems. And God is the absolute opposite of that. He is the answer to our problems. And he says, hey, take comfort in faith. Take comfort in faith. Everybody needs comfort. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to get to in the next chapter. All right. What does Paul say about the rapture? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Why? Because the rapture is a comfort thing. That's another thing the devil says, hey, he keeps saying he's going to come, but he hasn't come. They said the rapture is going to happen on the eclipse. It didn't happen. If it did, we all in trouble. It was going to happen the first day of, of, of the Passover. The, the Passover started, the Passover of Israel. It's going to happen when the, when the red heifer gets sacrificed. It's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. Now they're saying it's going to happen between now and May 19th. People are so desperate for it. They want it to happen, and we should want it to happen. But the devil says, keep on having those guesses and then being disappointed and then saying, God, it's your fault, God. Why aren't you coming to get us? Why aren't you delivering us from this world? And listen, God says, listen, here's the attitude you should have. The comfort of my faith doesn't necessarily say, I want you to come, God, to deliver me from this world. I I want you to come because I want to be with you. But when we get disenamored with our faith and disenamored with our God, we begin to pray desperation instead of praying the prayers of hope. Not like I hope God's coming, but the coming of my Savior is my hope. So tonight, my friend, church member, watching online, make the faith your comfort. Make the very faith your comfort. Somebody called me this week to talk to me about this. I'll close with this. And we had a long conversation on the phone. And, and I revealed to this person some of the things that, that have gone on in my life in the last three years that I would never talk about from the pulpit. Just, just annoying things that the devil has done to me in my life physically. Think crazy things. Crazy, crazy things. I, I, I'm not going to belabor you with it. God takes care of all that stuff. And literally, it's like Paul, where he asked the Lord three times, remove this thorn from my flesh. Remove this thorn from my flesh. My wife and kids know what I'm talking about. And that's about it. That's about all it knows. And literally, Jesus finally comes and says, Paul, don't you understand that that thorn that you've grown to despise is the actual thorn that keeps you closer to me? Without the thorn, you might go distant. Don't go distant. Stay close. And Paul came to realization, okay, I don't want this thorn removed from me now. I'll die with this thorn in my flesh. Because Paul made the faith his comfort. God is good. Had your bad eyes closed. Thank you for listening so well tonight. God is good. Hello, Pastor Randy Dignan here from Bible Baptist Church in Jefferson City, Missouri. Let me take a moment and express to you what our main vision and purpose is of this ministry. You see, much of this world today has a question. It's a question that was asked in John chapter 3 by one person. It's a question that is asked by the masses, but when you really think about it, it's really a question we all have to come to grips with, face to face with, one on one in our lives, sometime in our life. The question is this, where will I spend eternity? And that question was asked by a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He approached Jesus Christ in the middle of the night and had a question about spiritual matters. Well, good thing for Nicodemus. He came to the right person at the right time because Jesus Christ is the answer in spiritual matters. You see, many of us have questions about that, and man has tried in many of its efforts to answer that question with their own ideas and philosophies. We've tried to come up with ideas on how to get us to heaven, how to confirm our way to heaven. But the fact is we got to find out what God says about eternal things. And that's why asking Jesus Christ that question is so vital because when you ask Jesus a question, you get the answer. And as the question was asked, Jesus answered simply this, you must be born again. In John chapter three, that's what he said to Nicodemus. And that's the same thing he says to you and to me, even today. You see, God is God of this universe, but he's not everybody's father. What does that have to do with John chapter 3? Well, think about this. We all have birthdays. We all are physically born under this physical planet. Or else you wouldn't be able to watch me or I wouldn't be able to sign to you right now or talk to you at this time. 
But God, being a spiritual being, knew that though our bodies are temporal, our spiritual part of us, our spiritual anatomy of us, is an eternal thing. And so God says, I'm more concerned about the spiritual issues. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you and me 2,000 years ago and live again three days later so that you and I can have a spiritual birthday and know for sure that heaven is our home. Well, that leads to the next question. Why do we need a spiritual birthday? Well, it's simple. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's law and God's commands. But God loves us so much so that he let Jesus Christ become the substitute for your sin and my sin so that if we recognize and admit that we are sinners, we can then trust in Jesus Christ as our substitute and more so than that, our personal Savior and know that on top of our physical birthdays, we have a spiritual birthday now in that God becomes our father, we become his sons, daughters, we become his children, and we know we're going to go to heaven someday. My friend, it's very simple. It's not about what the church says, or what I have ideas about, or what you have ideas about. It's finding out what God says directly to you and me. And he did it right there in the Bible, and in particular, John chapter 3, when Jesus says, you must be born again. If our church can help you with that question, if you have any questions about that, we can give you some answers. We'd be glad to help you in any way we can. Again, Pastor Randy, personally thanking you for watching the message. And again, if there's anything we can do for you, let us know. God bless and make it a great day.